Now, if you will, look with me in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. This is God's Word, and it's the truth. He has just said, this Word of God that abides forever is the good news that is preached to you. Now what? So, put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, and you'll remember literally, long for the pure wordy milk the milk of the Word, the wordy milk, that by it, the wordy milk, you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. The grass withers, the flower fades, God's Word abides forever by His grace and mercy. May His Word be preached for you. Please be seated. Well, we've got a little bit of a truncated time, so I'm going to have to jump into this pretty quickly. Uh, I won't say less, but I'll say it faster. All right? So, you ready? Here we go. You got your note sheet that's there. Uh, we are coming to this section of 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'm calling it Foundations. Now, I'm not an Auburn engineer like many of you in this congregation, and I thank the Lord for you, but I have learned this. Um, I can tell you this. If I want to know how big a building's going to be, if I want to know how tall it's going to be, all I have to do is look at the foundation. The foundation is the giveaway for the size, the width, and the height, and the breadth of any building. Well, Peter is going back, having laid a foundation for elect exiles of your life in Christ and for Christ in this world. Peter is now going back to the foundation. He's going to solidify it. He is going to make it more weighty. He's going to dig it a little deeper, and he's going to add something to it in this text. And in so doing, we're going to take a couple of weeks in 1 Peter 2, verses 4 through 10, and in so doing, there's foundations that he is making solid, he is deepening, he is strengthening. In so doing, there's a couple of things that are benefiting us right away today. What are those? Here's one. The first thing is a crucial pattern that is essential for the Christian life is being restated and reinforced in this text. A crucial pattern for the effectiveness and faithfulness of a Christian life is being restated and reaffirmed in what we're studying. Number two, the relationship of the Old and New Testament is being reaffirmed before us for clarity. Those two things are crucial. But there's a third thing that is extremely crucial for us. Not only is there this crucial pattern that's in place, not only is there this solidification and the relationship of the Old and the New Testament, but we're going to find out something about our relationship to Christ and what it means about our identity in this world. Now, let's jump into it. Here's where I'd like to jump into it. If, um, if um, there is, there, if you decided to study worldviews, and by the way, all of you have one, when something happens, you've got glasses, you've got a filter, you've got a prism that you put it through. If it's raining that day, I'll find out pretty, pretty quickly through your prism whether you think that's good weather or bad weather. And I'll find out pretty, in other words, we all have worldviews through, through which we interpret prosperity, adversity, challenges, opportunities, everything in life, we've got a worldview that we have adopted. Now, if we were to take a study in it, the isms of worldviews are countless. There's humanism and secularism and, and um, positivism and materialism and consumerism and on and on and on. The isms of worldviews are countless. But if you don't mind, since I'm a simple person, I'm going to help you simplify. And the simplification is this. There's really only two. All of the isms are only um, various expressions of, of the one. And the key to it is in the words that our Savior gave to the apostles in general, and Peter in particular. Do you remember when Jesus had the disciples on the road to Caesarea Philippi, and he told them, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be put to death by the scribes and the Pharisees. I'm going to be raised up on the third day. And Peter put that through his world and life view, put that through his prism, and what did he come out with? God forbid that this should happen to you. 
And what does Jesus say to Peter? That's the guy that wrote this book that we're studying. What did he say? Get behind me. Now, he's not telling him that he is Satan. He is telling him that statement is the personification of Satan's desire to stop him from this redeeming work. And Peter had arrived at a statement in league with Satan. Why? Because he, his world and life view. How do you know that, Pastor? Because of the next sentence. Get behind me, Satan, for you have set your mind on man's interests and not upon God's. Those are your two worldviews, the sovereign self or the sovereign God. All of the other worldviews are just manifestations of the sovereign self. Peter, at that moment, faltering, had looked at what Jesus said through his own eyes of the sovereign self instead of the purposes of a sovereign God. And he had decided what was the greatest thing that was about to happen in history was something that should be avoided and should be forbidden, God forbid, because of his worldview. Now, the reason I say that to you is because that leads to another simplification. If, if I was to list all of the, go get an encyclopedia of the religions of the world, and it is enormous. But I would like to just simply say to you, here's the fact. There's either true religion, i.e. what James says, this is pure or true religion, or there's false religion. All the other religions are simply manifestations, man-made manifestations that come from a world and life view of the sovereign self applied to religion, and those are what, that's what exists, all false religions. And we can study all of the cults and all of the false religions, but here's what they all have in common because of a world and life view of the sovereign self. They all have this in common. They all tell you what you have to do or give to obtain salvation. That's what will be consistent in all of them. They will all tell you what you have to do or give to obtain salvation. That means they're all about the sovereign self, self-reliance, self-righteousness, self-exaltation. It's my sincerity that saves me. It's my giving that saves me. It's my deeds that saves me. It's my works that saves me. It's my rituals that save me. But their true religion is not what you do and give to obtain salvation. In fact, true religion, first of all, informs you what you do and give is not the answer. It's part of the problem. Even our righteousness is like filthy rags. What true religion says is this, it's what God does and gives that obtains salvation for us, not by us, but for us. Now, that doesn't mean in true religion we don't do and give, but it changes our doing and our giving. We do not do and give to be saved or to stay saved are to help God save us, we do and give because of the fact that God has saved us. We don't do and give for salvation. We do and give for the Savior who has secured our salvation. And that factor, that gospel blessings of what God has done to save you must be understood before gospel commands are applied is a crucial pattern that's being reaffirmed in what we're about to read. Let me say it again. The crucial pattern, Paul and Peter are unalterably committed to this pattern. They will not tell you what you do. Here's what Peter calls you, elect exiles. Elect, that's who you are in Christ before the foundation of this world. Exiles, that's who you are for Christ in this world. You are resident aliens, ambassadors for Christ, on a mission, with the message, in ministry, and your supreme allegiance is to the King of kings and Lord of lords as you reside in the nations of this world. And the reason you have that calling is because God has called you before the foundation of the world. Therefore, this is who he takes great pains to tell you 
who you are in Christ before He ever tells you what you do for Christ. You find no gospel commands until he articulates with clarity the gospel blessings. What did he do? Where did he do that? He did that in 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 through 12. He told you that you are, that God has an inheritance he is keeping for you. He is keeping it for you. You don't keep it. He keeps it. And then he tells you, not only do you have an inheritance that he is keeping for you, you are his inheritance, and he is keeping you for your inheritance. He keeps you for the inheritance he is keeping for you. These are the gospel blessings secured by Jesus Christ. Then he tells you, you're right with God. And the reason you're right with God is not because of the gold and silvers you bring. No, not perishable things. You are right with God because of the imperishable blood of Jesus Christ. And then he says to you, you're not only right with God, God is right within you because you've been born again by the imperishable seed, the Word of God in the hands of the Spirit of God. This is who you are in Christ. You are born again. You are justified. You have an inheritance. You are kept. Now, settling those blessings of the gospel in Christ. Now, here are your gospel commands from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through chapter 2 and verse 4. And he gives a series of commands, but he gives three framing commands. I've called them the axioms that lay out the Christian life as a pilgrimage in the wilderness of this world on mission, on message, and in ministry for Christ. Three axioms. Here's the first one we learned. A divine summons to a personal pursuit of pervasive holiness. He says this, be holy in all of your conduct, for I am holy. Notice he doesn't say do it for your salvation. Jesus has provided that holiness. It's perfect. Do it for your Savior because He is holy. Now, you take all of your life, all of yourself, all of your relationships, and set out obeying the commandment, increasingly, God, I want everything in my life to be yours. Your ma- this is your marriage. These are your children. This is your job. I do my work heartily unto the Lord. I raise my children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I engage in my relationship with my husband or my wife in and for Christ. I want this job belongs to you. My hobbies belong to you. My eating and drinking, whether I eat or drink or whatever I do to the glory of God. Increasingly, God, put me on this journey of holiness, a pursuit of pervasive holiness, not not to be saved, but as an offering to my Savior. I've already heard the gospel blessings, I am saved. This is what I do for my Savior. The second axiom that he gave to us was this one. You know what? This pursuit of pervasive holiness, I'm not in this by myself. I got brothers and sisters, and I'm here to help them, and they're here to help me. So the second one, the second divine summons in 1 Peter chapter 1 was this, that we are to love one another sincerely and earnestly. We are to love one another sincerely and earnestly from our new heart in Jesus Christ. That's what God has called us to do. The third thing is a divine summons to nurture a craving appetite for the Word of God and the preaching of the Word of God. All flesh is like grass. Y'all notice that? The glory withers. Looked in the mirror recently. I know know you think it looks the same. It don't. It just doesn't look that way. Uh, All flesh is grass, all of its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord abides forever. And this good news was preached to you. Now, get rid of all appetites. Your appetite for that word Long for the pure wordy milk, the wordy milk. Long for the pure milk of the word. That means you got to get rid of some appetite suppressants. Get rid of all malice, all hypocrisy, all envy, all deceit, all slander. If you make peace treaties with those, that will suppress your appetite for the Word of God preached. So get rid of those. 
to nurture a craving, a yearning, a longing for the wordy milk which is preached to you. So that brought us to our third summons, a divine summons to nurture a relentless appetite for the Word of God and the preaching of the Word of God so that by, remember what I just read? By it you may grow in the grace of Christ if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Now, we're ready for the next section in Peter. And you know what Peter's doing? Hold it. Time out. No more commandments for a while. I'm going to go back to the foundation. There's some more stuff I want to put in the foundation. Time out. No more commandments. No imperatives. But for these next verses, chapter 2, verse 4, all the way down to, chapter, uh, down to verse 10, I'm going to go back and I want to solidify the foundation. There's some more things you need to know before I give you some more gospel commands. You, there's some more gospel blessings that are yours in Christ that you need to know. So let's take a look at them. Look with me in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. And when you get to verse 4, let's start right here. As you come to Him. Okay, hold it. Stop right there. <laughs> Stop right there. As you come to Him. What does it mean to come to Him? Well, as you are coming, literally, that text is saying, as you are coming to Him. Well, you got to put it into context. When you prioritize and nurture a craving appetite for the Word of God preached, you're not coming to the preacher. You're coming to Him. And faith comes by hearing Him through the preaching. You're actually coming to Him. Isn't it interesting how this phrase, come, is so synonymous with saving faith and living by faith? Any of you weary and heavy laden, let Him, what? Come to me. Come to me, all of you that are weary and heavy laden. Those who come to me, I will in no wise cast out. That is, folks, in other words, I'm telling you, there's a reason we just sang, just as I am, I'm coming. That's why we sang it. Not only in your conversion, but as a way of life. When you prioritize and nurture a relentless appetite for God's Word and the preaching of God's Word, what you're actually saying is, coming to Jesus is more important than anything else in my life. I am empty without Him. I am discouraged without Him. I can't live this life without hearing Him. And this is where He has said, you hear me. My sheep know my voice. That's why passages like this are so challenging to me as a preacher, but instructive as well. Such as Romans 10, 13, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How shall they call upon Him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in Him whom they have not heard? In other words, you can't believe in Him until you hear Him. How shall they believe in Him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear Him without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? Faith comes, uh, uh, how beautiful are the feet who bring the good news of glad things. Why? Because faith comes by hearing the Word of Christ. Please forget the preacher for a minute. That's the reason we used to robe ourselves in black robes. The black robe said two things. One, this man didn't send himself. He bears the credentials of having been prepared and tested. The second thing the robe said was, the man is nothing. We are being saved through the foolishness, not of the preacher, but of the preaching of the Word. And my sheep know my voice, and they follow me. Now, believe me, on this side of this, I cannot tell you how weighty and awesome and <laughs> contributes to my sleepless Saturday nights. On the other side of it, coming to Christ is prioritizing His Word, which was designed, which was given to you to be read, but designed to be preached. 
And that preaching of the Word becomes that whereby He begins to feed you. So now he says, I've just said, I've called you to a relentless appetite. Now, when you develop that appetite for the wordy milk, now as a way of life, now that way of life is coming to him. Now, who is him? Now, Peter is about to tell you who Jesus is. And this is not an exhaustive statement of who Jesus is, but he's about to tell you something about who Jesus is in the next word. Look at it. As you come to him, what is him? A living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion. He said, let me tell you why I'm calling Jesus a living stone. The Bible tells me to. In the Scripture, what does the Scripture say? Here's what it says. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in Him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builder rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumbled because they disobeyed the Word, as they were des destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possessions, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Notice, no commands. He doesn't tell you what to do in the text. He's going back to the foundation to tell you who you are, the gospel blessings. In fact, notice the R. He tells you who you are. See what he says? Go back to verse 5. You yourselves like living stones are. Notice he doesn't say build yourself up. You are being built up. And another, there's another building yourself up text, but this one is telling you who you are in Christ, the living stone. You are being built up as a spiritual house. You are a holy priesthood. You are offering spiritual sacrifices except after God, for it stands in Scriptures. You are, notice what he says, you are honored. Go down to verse 9. You are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are His people for His own possession. You once were not a people. You are now God's people. You once had not received mercy. You now have received mercy. You are recipients of mercy. He is telling you who you are. Is he going to give us some gospel commands? Yes, but he goes back to the foundation to solidify it, put more weight to it, take it deeper by telling you who you are. You're a living stone. You're a royal priesthood. You are offering spiritual sacrifices. You are a holy temple where God resides. You are my people. You are my chosen people. You are precious in my sight. That's who you are because of who Jesus is, and you are in Him, and He is in you. <clears throat> He's digging the foundation deep because He wants your life to go up a lot higher, and that's what He's doing. But by the way, there is one difference. In 1 Peter 1, the focus was what He was doing in you personally. You're born again. You're justified. Now, it's what He's doing in us corporately. All of you, that's a plural. In other words, Southern American standard, all y'all are stones, living stones. All y'all are a holy priesthood, singular priesthood, all y'all. All y'all are spiritual sacrifices. All y'all are His temple, His dwelling places. And now He goes to the corporate. You can't get into the kingdom on a group plan. You've got to personally commit your life to Jesus. But when you commit your life to Christ, you don't live the Lone Ranger individual life. You live it connected to one another in Christ and for Christ. And it is absolutely as ridiculous as an arm to go off and think it can live by itself for a professing Christians to try to live disconnected from the people of God in the local church. 
we are connected to one another. Together, we're a spiritual house. Together, we're a holy priesthood. Together, we are offering spiritual sacrifices. Together, we are doing those things together in and for Christ. And that's the foundation he's laying. So I've got to do this quickly. So what does God say about Jesus in the text? Well, he calls him a rock. Jesus, God himself, God's evaluation of his son is this. My son is a living stone. According, notice what it said. According to God, Jesus is a living stone. Secondly, he is a, pres- a chosen stone. Thirdly, he is a precious stone. Fourthly, he's the cornerstone. I had a chance to show that to a lot of people in Israel, the way they build houses. They would go to a place, you'd find a deeply embedded big rock, and then you would go get other big rocks, and you would line them up this way, and you'd line them up that way, 90 degree angles, then you'd line them up this way, line them up that way, and now you put your flooring on top of that foundation, and when you put your flooring on top of that foundation, everything leans against the cornerstone. Jesus is the cornerstone. In fact, if you don't mind, I've got to ask you to go to one text of Scripture for me. Go to Ephesians 2 that explains all of this. Go to Ephesians 2. That's backwards in your Bible. You got that pew Bible, just go backwards uh, to Ephesians chapter 2, page 976. uh, Actually, go to page 977. And notice what it says in Ephesians 2. This is a commentary. This is Paul telling you what Peter is telling you. Here's the way Paul says it in verse 19. So then, all y'all, you, are no longer strangers and aliens from God, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. That's Peter's succinct statement of what Paul, Peter, I mean Paul's succinct statement of what Peter has told us in 1 Peter chapter 2. So who is Jesus according to God? According to God, he's a living stone, a chosen stone, a precious stone, a cornerstone. What is he according to the unregenerate men? What is man's evaluation? Here's what it is. Number one, he is a rejected stone. That's an interesting word in the original language. It has to do with looking at something, making an evaluation, and discarding it. I think I probably am speaking to some people that work in the quality control inspection. You know, you're the person that looks at the garment that was made, and after they've gone through the process to see if it goes out to the store. Is this something we want to put out with our name on it? You do quality. That's the picture of this. You know, you're sitting there looking. No, I can't do that. Tanger outlet. I can't do that. Uh, Wholesale outlet. It's not going to our store. You've rejected it. You've set it aside. It's a discard. That's an X out. So what does unregenerate man do with the call of Christ? Well, God says he's a living stone. By the way, isn't that interesting? Living stone. Do you think of living and stone together? It's kind of like jumbo shrimp. (laughs) Do you think of the two that way, living stone? I mean, don't we say things like, oh, he's stone dead. I mean, you wouldn't go plant a seed in a stone, would you? It's dead. But Jesus, while all of the blessings of the stability and strength of the rock, is not a dead stone, a living stone, and everything he's in and everything that's in him lives. He is a living stone. What do men say when they look at Jesus? They say no, and they throw him away. They reject him. He is a, he is a rejected stone. Number two, he is a He is a stumbling stone. They stumble over him. Number three, he is an offending stone. That's man's evaluation of Jesus. One other thing. If you're in Christ, the living stone, the chosen stone, the precious stone, the cornerstone, what are you? Here's what Peter says you are. 
You are living stones. You are a spiritual house. You are a holy priesthood. You are bringing living spiritual sacrifices. That's what you are. You and I are born in this world stone dead. But if Christ is in you and you are in Christ, Christ the living stone makes you a living stone. And then with his people, he's building you up into a place of his dwelling, a spiritual house, a temple. This is my father's house. And wherever you got a temple, you got a priesthood. And a priesthood brings sacrifice. Now, folks, get this. Get it, get it, get it, get it, get it. You can't have a religion without a dwelling place for God. You got to have a temple. We don't go back to the Old Testament temple. That's done. That's fulfilled in Jesus. You're the temple now. You are the spiritual house that he is building up together as his dwelling place. Remember Ephesians 2? And whenever you have a temple, you got to have a priesthood. You're the priesthood. All of you. There's not a class of priests. You're all priests. In other words, if you want to send me over the edge, call me a priest. I'm not one. I'm a pastor. There are elders. There are deacons. There are no priests because we're, there's no class of priests because we're all priests. To have a religion that's true, that's God-secured, you've got to have a dwelling place of God. You're all the dwelling place of God. You're all priests. You are all bringing sacrifices. You are the sacrifice. Remember your confession a while ago? Ladies, I know you didn't hear it because you were coming down. I urge you, therefore, brethren, not for, but by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. So the, the new covenant, notice, See the trajectory? Do you see all these Old Testament terms, stones, temples, priests? We don't take Christianity back to the Old Testament. The whole purpose of the Old Testament was to bring the truth fulfilled in Christ. And so here is Christ, and Christ has, the living stone has made you living stones. Christ has, the high priest has made you all priests. Christ, the temple of God, the dwelling place of God, in all of his perfections, have made you his dwelling place, the dwelling place of God. And you are bringing spiritual sacrifices. That's what is happening. That's the way you see it. The trajectory of the Old Testament is bringing you to the fulfillment of Jesus Christ. And then you in Christ reveal who he is in life. Well, so what are you? You are living stones. You're a spiritual house, the temple of God. You're a holy priesthood, and you're bringing spiritual sacrifices. So um, let me just give you this in closing. Here's the takeaways. I'll just enumerate them, and you can walk away with them. The number one is this, nurturing a relentless craving for the preaching and reading of the Word of God is tantamount actually coming to Christ. And don't think you've got to get better to come to Christ and His Word and preaching. Come just as I am, and let me assure you, you'll never leave just as you are forgiven, redeemed, and transformed by the power of His Spirit with His Word. Make your coming to Christ not only what you did at your conversion, but a way of life. Come to Him daily, consistently, Lord's days. Make sure there is nothing more important than coming to Him. Then secondly, second takeaway, the Old Testament is fulfilled in Christ, and the New Testament is expounding Christ. Here's the way I try to tell people. My grandmother used to make me and, and my family, she would make sweaters. She was a knitter. She knitted. My other grandmother actually made a living as a knitter. If my grandmother's made you a sweater and you've got it on, and all of a sudden there's a pick. You know what a pick is, right? The strand. Don't pull the pick. You pull the pick, 
You don't have a sweater, you got a ball of yarn. That's your Bible. Habakkuk, 1 Peter, John, Romans, wherever you reach in and pick, it's the glory of the triune God revealed in the preeminence of Jesus as creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Augustine was right. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. The Old Testament is a beautifully furnished room, but all I can see is the shadows. The New Testament cuts the light on, and you see the beauty of it in our fairest Lord Jesus. Here's the third thing. Here's my last thing, so just hang with me on this. I'm only going to take a second. But this is a lifetime. The question, whose evaluation of Christ do you believe? Men rejected a stone of offense, a stone of stumbling. Or do you accept God's evaluation? He is my precious, chosen, living stone, a corner stone. He is not your rock of offense. He is the rock of your salvation. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. So what's your evaluation? Well, pastor, I haven't made it yet. Oh, yes, you have. (laughs) Sorry, Jesus has made this clear. If you're not for me, you're against me. So will you take the evaluation of man-made religion in its self-reliance, self-righteousness, self-exaltation, or will you take that step of humility? I'm a sinner. Jesus is not a rock I'm stumbling over. He's not the rock of offense. He is the rock of my salvation. And by the way, who is it that's telling you you are a priesthood and he's the rock? Who's telling you that? The Spirit of God through who? What human author are we studying? Who? No, Rocky. Rocky. I just gave away my age at that moment. That's what I call Peter, Rocky. Remember? You are Peter, meaning stone. And upon this rock, I will build my church. You want to know what the rock is? Go ask Rocky. In fact, you don't have to ask Rocky. Rocky just told you, I'm not the rock. There's no class of priest. Rocky just told you, he's the rock. Now the question is, is he your rock? And if he is, are you coming to him every day? Because he's your salvation. He's your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the time that we could be together in your word. Holy Spirit, would you simply speak to our hearts now? Please speak. To those who have come, I think of the song that we sung. Oh God, I ask you, may they come just as I am tossed about with many conflicts and many doubts, fightings and fears within and without, but Jesus, I come. I come poor, wretched, blind. I come for sight, riches, healing of the mind. Yea, I believe the evaluation of God, of His Son. All I need in Thee I find. Jesus, I come. Thank you, Jesus, that you take us who are dead stones, change us to come to Christ, the living stone, becoming our cornerstone. And together, you make us living stones fashioned into the dwelling place of the Spirit of God together. Priests serving a Savior together, all of us. 
bringing spiritual sacrifices of praise and giving, but bringing the living sacrifice ourselves. Jesus, we come. Amen.